Quantum. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, hello, Everdon. Um, so we'll talk about quantum computing doomsday planning. I mean, it all sounds pretty scary, right? There's this image, doomsday. It was Halloween. We were dressed in black. Uh, but we're not here to scare you. We're not here to sc sell you any product. Quite the opposite. We're here to reassure you about this quantum business and give you, let's say, insights about what a real attack would look like and what you can do now to completely eliminate the, the risk. Okay. So does any of you have a quantum computer? No? Okay, good. So we can start. Okay, uh, who are we? So I'm JP. Uh, it's done my first talk here. I've been here uh, like 10 years ago when it was the, the AppSec forum. I don't know, was anyone at the AppSec? You remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all faces. Um, so I'm now running a company called Taurus. We don't do quantum stuff. I'm happy to be here with, uh, with Arida. So I'm a cybersecurity master's student at EPFL. I interned at Taurus, and it's my first ever conference talk. No pressure. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so as JP said, in this talk, we'll talk about quantum computing and what are the main achievements by companies and researchers. Uh, we'll talk about post-quantum cryptography, mainly focusing on the NIST standardization um, process. And then we will show what the risks are for your systems by showing how different attack, a real quantum attack would work on different protocols. And then finally, we'll show us the solutions available to protect your systems. All right. So I'll try to keep it very short. Uh, what is a quantum computer? We're not trying to tell you what it's not and what are the common misconceptions about quantum computing. All right, so why people created this thing in the first place? So it was not to give talks at hacking conferences. It was not to break crypto. It was to something maybe more interesting, which was simulating physics with computers at the time. It was in 81, so Richard Feynman, he had this idea of... Uh, you know, simulating the evolution of something like an atom uh, with its cloud of electrons using computer. And he wrote a paper where he found out that it was practically impossible because you had to keep track of a an exponential number of, of particles, of, you know, of, um, of values of numbers. And it was like, okay, we cannot do it with our classical computers, like integrated circuits, um, any type of classical computing model. So he had the idea of, okay, let's just use, you know, nature, let's just use quantum objects to simulate quantumness in the first place. And that's why we are here and giving this, this talk, kind of. So the main point of quantum computer is that it's a completely different model of computing. You don't run a code, you don't run an algorithm, you cannot, you cannot bin defeat, uh, forget about it. You have a state, a state of stuff, which is, you know, very similar to particles, to atoms. So it's a quantum state. It behaves according to these very weird laws of quantum mechanics. And the computation is about transforming this state into a different state using a number of transformations that now we call quantum gates. And at the end, you observe this state. And that's your result. So there are things that you can do with a quantum computer that you could not do with a classical one. So it's not about going faster as we're going to see uh, very soon. Maybe the main thing I want to present is this concept of quantum bit or qubit and the idea of superposition, which is very weird. Um, so I'm not going to try to explain it because I don't really understand it myself and nobody really understands how it works, but everybody accepts that it, as a matter of fact, it, it does work. So a normal bit on a computer, it's zero or it's one. And a quantum bit, well, it's kind of zero and one at the same time, but not really. It's pretty weird. Uh, it's characterized by two numbers that I write alpha and beta here. They're kind of, kind of probabilities, but not really probabilities. You know, probability is a number between zero and one. And here they can be negative probabilities and even complex numbers, you know, like imaginary numbers. That becomes completely weird, like nonsense. But nonetheless, when you decide to observe the qubit, like you open the box where the gut is, then the qubit, you see a zero or one. But it doesn't, be the, it doesn't mean that the zero or one was hidden and you could not see it. No, it was a state that, is, that was completely random. 
and not random as, oh, I don't have in enough information to predict what's going to happen, but random as really non-deterministic. So there's no hidden variable, there's no, no catch. And that's how it works. That's not why it works, but it's completely weird and you cannot simulate it with classical computers because you don't have this quantum mechanical ph phenomena and you don't have pure randomness. So the main point, uh, there's one thing I want you to remember from this talk is this is what uh, the lady says on the right, is that the quantum speed up, you know, it's not a matter of trying everything at the same time. Because intuitively it's tempting to think that, okay, zero and one at the same time, so you, you try all the, all the keys simultaneously. Uh, that's not really like this, it's really not like this in fact. Uh, but there are some problems that you can solve much faster with these quantum computers. So not faster like my, my washing machine, it's a quantum model because it's going faster than the previous generation. It's not about frequency, it's not about doing the same stuff much faster. It's about doing, co doing completely different stuff and in fact quite slower. So it's not about trying all the solutions at the same time, it's not about being faster, and it will not solve all the problems. Just very few, very specific problems. But for certain problems you have what we call an exponential speed up. So exponentially better, exponentially faster. And that's yeah, why we give this talk, because it matters in crypto. Um, there's a quantum algorithm. Well, I just told you that quantum is not about algorithms, but we call it algorithm nonetheless. Because you do one thing, then you do another thing, so it's, yeah, an algorithm. The first problem is the, you know, if you're 12 year old, if you're in primary school, you, drill, you just learned this uh, factorization, factoring, you go from a number n, to its prime factors P and Q. Well, it's, there can be two factors and can be more, but typically in crypto we have two factors. So if the number, numbers are very big, like, you know, thousands of digits, thousands of bits, then it's very hard, it's practically impossible to go from the number to its factorization P and Q. So you got the idea maybe if you know a bit crypto, so N is kind of the public key and P and Q is kind of the private key. So if you can solve this problem, then you can break RSA signatures, RSA encryption and whatnot. The second problem is a bit more complex, but still pretty straightforward. You have Y equal X to the power of D modulo P. You know X, you know Y, you know P. The game is to find D. So classically, it looks simple. Yeah, there's three, there's four numbers. I know three, I just have one to find. Well, in fact, this problem is hard. It's the reason why your SSH your TLS, all your VPN connections, uh, all your blockchain accounts, uh, all that stuff is secure just because of that stupid equa equation. So maybe it's not that stupid. So it's practically impossible on a classical machine, even if you have clear source of, of, of machine, even if you take all the computation on Earth, um, if you take all the computation on Earth, it might take a few months. Uh, I might regret this, but that's not, maybe not too far from, from reality. And the whole point is that Shor can break this efficiently in polynomial time, uh, we say. So do quantum computers exist today? Well, yes and no. Yes, there are some prototypes that are kind of quantum computers. They have like a bunch of qubits, like dozens up to hundreds, but they're kind of useless because they're not fault tolerant, meaning that there's a lot of noise uh, being injected into the system because these computers are made of very small stuff, like ions, uh, electrons, photons. And if you have any tiny movement or pressure or, you know, heat or anything, it disturbs the system. So you need to correct the errors. That's a real mess. Um, that's, that's why you need millions of quantum bits to, to crack RSA or empty curves. And these computers we have, they're very small, very specific to specific problems. So they're not universal. Universal means that you could run any computable function on it, and at the time we, we cannot. Um, but even if you have quantum computers that are, you know, not as big as the ones that could break crypto, where you need like millions of quantum bits, so as you can see on the, on the top right here, there might be a class of quantum computers in between that may be not completely useless in terms of um, cost efficiency to solve certain specific problems. Like in quantum chemistry and other domains, there's also like quantum AI, but I think it's a bit overhyped. Um, but we're not there yet. I think the main companies in this quantum computer engineering business, there's IBM, there's Google, a bunch of others. And if you go to the websites, uh, 
you got to be very careful about the claims they make because they often exaggerate a bit what uh, what I say. Anyway, that w was the quantum computer uh, introduction. I hope it was not too boring, but the, the idea is that quantum computer will not solve all problems. It doesn't try all the answers in parallel. So now let's go after quantum computer. computer let's go to post-quantum cryptography. So basically, post-quantum cryptography are public key cryptographic uh, schemes that are designed to withstand attacks from both classical computers and quantum computers. Uh, there are two main types of algorithms, so signature schemes like ECDSA today, and key encapsulation mechanisms, or CAMs, which are used for both encryption and key agreement. Uh, it is very important to note that post-quantum cryptography is different from quantum cryptography. Quantum cryptography relies on the principles of quantum mechanics, while post-quantum cryptography is run on a classical computer but is quantum safe. So there are different design approaches to post-quantum cryptography. The most popular is the ones based on lattice problems. So a lattice, or tri in French, is a collection of points in a multidimensional space, as we can see there. Um, and these are what present the best trade-offs in terms of performance and security. Uh, slightly less popular are those based on error correcting codes or coding theory. They're still pretty good in terms of performance. Uh, another approach are hash trees. They are extremely secure. They are, they rely entirely on symmetric cryptography, so very little math. Uh, but they're not very practical because they have huge keys and signatures. Uh, a lot less secure are multivariate polo polynomials. And then there's also elliptic curve isogenies, MPC in the head, and zero knowledge proof based. But there's still active areas of research that are a lot less mature. So how do we go from that theory to deployment? So NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, a U.S. government agency, has an open competition to select the next post-quantum cryptographic standards. So they started with the first round in 2017 till 2023 today. And so at each round, they have selection criteria for the different algorithms. So the main one is the security level that is achieved. We can see the different security levels in the table. And then you still need them to be usable. So you evaluate performance, so encryption, decryption speed, key size, etc. And then you would consider algorithm and implementation simplicity, etc. So here we can see the timeline of the standardization product uh, project. So in 2016, it started with the first formal call for proposals. And then by 2022, uh, it was the fourth round, they announced the candidates to be standardized. So Kyber, Dilithium, and Falcon are lattice-based, and Sphinx is hash-based. They announced an additional round in 2023, where the idea is to diversify all of the signature protocols and try to find one that is not um, lattice-based. And we can clearly see that not one single algorithm will be chosen as a standard because they all offer different trade-offs, and so it would highly depend on the application. Um, in August of 2023, they released draft standards. Uh, we should expect the final standards to be released very, very soon, and we highly recommend that you wait for the final standards before incorporating them to your systems. Here we can see an example of post-quantum cryptography used uh, in TLS. So we can ignore the green lines. The white lines are classical cryptography, so elliptic curve cryptography, and then the red lines, uh, the pink lines, post-quantum cryptography. So if we look at the left of the table, we can see that uh, when we look at the sizes, everything is a lot larger in post-quantum cryptography. But when we look at the right, performance-wise, for example, Kyber is like 10 times faster for key generation than classical cryptography. And now JP will talk how, about how we can attack the different protocols. All right. So... Um but attacking real protocols using quantum computers, well, hypothetical quantum computers. So there's the three main scenarios are the following. Um, let, let's start from the bottom, the worst one, encryption. So let's say you encrypt data today, you send like a PGP encrypted email and it gets captured by people, or you have encrypted backups. 
Um, the, then there's this idea of, you know, store now decrypt later. So people might store the ciphertext that you encrypted today and like 50 years, 60 years from now, when they have a quantum computer, they will be able to decrypt it. And there's nothing you can do because it's gone. Maybe they have made copy of it. And, um, so it's the worst case to consider and the, the case to prioritize in terms of transitioning to post quantum crypto. Then the case in on top, signatures. So it's the, the least bad because signature is not about protecting the secrecy or confidentiality of information. It's about integrity, about endorsing something. So you can sign something today and like 10 years from now, you see a quantum computer is about to be created. So you can be like, okay, now I'm going to sign again, but this time with a post quantum signature. And I'm going to revoke my old non post quantum signing key. So with signatures, you can wait until like just the day before the quantum computer exists. Whereas with encryption, it's better to transition earlier because people can store now and decrypt later. The key agreement scenario is a bit in between and quite closer to encryption because key agreement is about using public key encryption, such as Diff Hellman, to create session keys that will be used to encrypt data and or sign data. But typically it depends on a multiple on multiple values. So the public keys and maybe other values. So you need to capture different pieces of data to decrypt, to store now and, and decrypt it later. So that's what we're going to see just right now with the case of uh, TLS. So TLS, transport layer security, you all know it, maybe under the name of uh, SSL. So it's arguably the most important security protocol on, uh, on internet, I guess. So it's used in a multitude of applications. So TLS is not one protocol. It's first of all, multiple versions of it. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 now. And each version of TLS has two sub protocols, the handshake. The handshake is when you initiate the session. So you say, hello, I'm the client. Hello, I'm the server. We, I want to talk to you. And you use public key encryption, asymmetric encryption to establish a key, to establish, well, multiple session keys, which are symmetric keys. Then there's the record protocol. The record protocol is really about protecting the application data just using symmetric encryption. So a type of encryption that is essentially safe against quantum computers. So we're only going to care about handshake and we're going to try and attack the, the handshake. So there's a, also a P PSK uh, pre-shared key version, which is immune to quantum computers. So the store now decrypt letter principle applies as follows in the case of a TLS session. So you start with a handshake. So you send a public key, they send a public key, you mix your, their public key with your private key and they do the same and you get uh, session keys and shared secrets. So the attacker has to do this in the first place to determine the, um, the session keys. And then they have to capture the traffic that they want to decrypt. But to decrypt it, they need not only the shared secret, they need some additional pieces of data. There's a kind of counter, a nonce in TLS that is incremented for each new pack package, each new message. So the attacker also needs to know what is the index of the message they want to decrypt. But if they don't know it, it's only 64 bits. So they could potentially brute force it. So anyway, they, they have to capture at least the handshake then they can wait and they can capture the piece of data they want to decrypt while ignoring all the traffic in between. And then it, it would work. They could decrypt relatively easily. It might take weeks, months, but uh, not billions of years. So now what about end-to-end -end encryption? So, I mean, TLS is end-to-end -end encryption if the client and the server are the two ends. But if the two ends are clients and not the server, then we call it end-to-end -end encryption. I mean, Cryptographer, we don't know how to name things, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so if you use WhatsApp or Signal, they're both using a protocol that is very similar, that is doing a bunch of stuff under the hood, and a lot of public key operations. So there's a kind of handshake um, the first time you create a session with someone, but it's called Extended Triple Diffie Hellman Key Agreement, X3DH in short. Um, but it's not finished because you do this to establish a fraud a first shared secret. And then as you exchange messages, so every time you send a bunch of messages, you're going to create 
another diff hellman key exchange using ephemeral keys that you're going to delete after you've used them. So that's what is called a double ratchet protocol, uh, which combines diff hellman and hashing of, uh, of the keys. So this is all designed to provide forward secrecy and backward secrecy and be quite stronger than TLS. So what do you need to do as a quantum attacker in that case? So of course you need to capture the, the handshake in the first one, the first session, but you need to capture all the traffic from the very first handshake defend man up to the piece of data of application data that you, you want to decrypt. So there's a, a lot more data to store. And if you missed just one difficult man, or if you fail to decrypt it, to break it, then you're not going to be able to decrypt the, the message that you want to decrypt later on. So it's a lot of work, but it's, uh, would be doable, just a bit harder than TLS. So now what about, uh, 4G, 5G, 3G, 2G, 6G maybe? Um, the phones, they're pretty dumb and stupid, but that's not necessarily bad. So in your eSIM, uh, just get a message. In, in your eSIM, uh, in your virtual SIM, your SIM card, you have a symmetry key of 128 bits. But you're not the only one to have it. The, your provider, your telco operator, they also have it in their authentication center. So it's a case of what we call pre-shared key, and this key doesn't change. It's always the same key in your SIM card. So it sounds quite boring and stupid and from the 80s, even before public key crypto existed, but it's so boring and old and simple that it's secure against quantum computers, ironically. Um, so not too bad. Um, even though in, in theory, I mean, in theory, quantum computers could reduce the security, but it's really on paper and not in reality from my perspective. Uh, in 5G, there's a protocol called EAP TLS that is using TLS, but I don't think most people use it, so that is generally fine. Good news. Um, so now to be more specific about VPN secure channels, so a lot of VPN services, a lot of VPN software use TLS, so we just mentioned TLS. IPsec is quite similar. There's the idea of a handshake and of a record protocol. Um, and the handshake is usually the IKEA uh, V2 now, so it's essentially the Hellman stuff. WireGuard is uh, a bit of the same, but also quite different. Uh, it has probably more resilience to quantum computers due to the fact that the public keys are less exposed. Um, like the, a server will not respond with a public key if you're not whitelisted. And there's already a few tricks, a few tweaks that are documented to make where I got post quantum. So if you look this up, you will find it quite, quite easily. And you can, you can also combine PSKs with public key based crypto. Okay. Now the topic that everybody is expecting blockchain, cryptocurrency by Bitcoin. Um, so I'm very sorry to tell you that blockchain will be destroyed by quantum computers, um, as of today, but they can upgrade relatively easily because most of the time it's only about signatures and not about encryption. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, they use ECDSA or some elliptic curve based signature scheme that would be broken. There's also some more exotic designs like BLS signatures. Uh, these would also be broken by quantum computers. So meaning that if I have your public key and your address, I can compute your private key and I can send your money to wherever. But since everything is broken, money will have no value. Uh, so what's the point? <clears throat> uh, what should not be overlooked is that there are some consensus protocols and a few other stuff in, crypt in blockchains that actually use public crypto for confidentiality. And in that case, you can apply the Stornar decryptator kind of attack. Uh, last but not least, uh, the ZK zero knowledge proof system. So. This is very arcane uh, kind of crypto, where typically it combines all the possible crypto you can imagine. In a ZK proof system, you can have, you know, hash functions, homomorphic encryption, polynomial commitments, um, you know, encryption, pretty much everything. And most of the time, it's relying on some variant of the discrete logarithm problem, meaning that it would be broken by quantum computers. So these are typically used today, for example, for private transfers, think like Zcash, Monero, and so on, uh, Aztec, as a layer two, and what we call the ZK EVM or private programs, whereby you would run a program on the blockchain, like a smart contract, and it would be validated as correct. 
and the state could be validated as sound in terms of input and output, but the validators could not be capable of learning what the program is doing. So you verify that the program is correct, but you have no idea what the program is. I mean, it sounds like nonsense, but it works because crypto is like magic sometimes. So there's several notions of security regarding ZK proofs. There's notion of being zero knowledge, ZKNS, of not leaking private data. So if you manage to break these proofs with respect to um, zero knowledge, some data might leak, but the proof that tend to be very small, like a few hundreds of bytes or three hundreds of, uh, of bits. So you can only leak as much as the size of the proof. But it's a kind of, yeah, stone out decuplator situation. Uh, the other case is what we call soundness or the capability to cheat. So like prove something that is not correct. Uh, but this is more akin to signatures in the sense that, you know, you can cheat, but you, you cannot, you know, cheat now and cheat later or whatever that, that means. Uh, you can wait until the quantum computer exists to upgrade your ZK proof systems. Okay. So. So I told you that everything is broken, but maybe there are solutions to, to unbreak stuff. So I'll let Farida explain this. Right. So here we have examples of already commercially available post-quantum TLS-based VPNs. So this is one by Cloudflare and one by AWS. And what they do is they use a hybrid approach, which means they combine classical cryptography with post-quantum cryptography, which means that to break the system, you would have to have the capabilities to break both. Um, there are also several companies that offer software libraries for post-quantum cryptography, and there are many uh, good open source projects. For example, the post-quantum TLS that AWS uses is also open source. And there is even quantum safe hardware. Um, here's an example from the British company PQ Shield. So they have a post quantum cryptography processor with optional side channel countermeasures. And yeah. That's, the oh, end. that's not the end. <laughs> that's the end of this part, not the end of the talk. Um, yeah, no, that's the, the start of the conclusion. So. Yeah, in summary, you don't really have to worry about this. I mean, if your biggest worry in your company is quantum computing, it means that you did all the rest right. All the CI, CD, you know, uh, software integrity, access management, uh, access control, you name it. So it should not be a priority, but nonetheless, I see, like in my company, we talk a lot with clients, auditors, and a lot of people, and we hear more and more these questions. Oh, are your systems quantum safe? Do you have a plan? Do you have this and that? And we say, yeah, we have done an inventory, uh, risk assessment, yada, yada. And I think once the, ten the, once the standards get finalized, we can expect them to be deployed in many more products. Uh, and so far, I mentioned Cloudflare, AWS. You will have post quantum crypto, most likely, you know, in the GCP, Google Cloud, Apple, and everywhere. So it might just be about, you know, adding a flag or it, it might be a default. I don't know. Um, so like I mentioned with the, the, the three, you know, uh, the three wet caps in terms of prioritization, it's more important to focus on encryption now as opposed to signatures. And if you run a, like a small a company, like a small company, a big company, it might be quite useful to do kind of inventory of where to use crypto. Are there cases where, you know, the stone out decuplator type of attacks might be relevant? Are there cases where you can have like quick wins? Where you can directly upgrade to post quantum crypto by just, you know, setting a flag to one. Um, we did it in my, my company and it, uh, was relatively, relatively easy. So there's a page with a lot of information. You know, one is one of these awesome, uh, things. Um, there's a few very good documents that have been published by a number of, uh, organizations. So this guide by the NIST, uh, NSA, I say very good FAQ, question, questions and answers. Uh, the French NIST has some very nice documents in French and in English. And I also put the links to the comics I showed earlier and to the list of um, problems for which you have a quantum speed up. It's called the, the quantum zoo. Okay, so I think we'll have time for questions. So thank you for your attention and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much, GP and Farida. Any question in the room? 
everything is clear about quantum computing. For me, not. Yeah. But <laughs> indeed. Okay. Now, yeah, there's a question over there. Thank you for the talk. I have a little question. I've sometimes heard in the field people saying, oh, we don't bother upgrading to TLS 1.2 or 1.3. We are waiting for post-quantum. What would you <laughs> respond to them? Oh, uh, first of all, I think that's a stupid reasoning because 1.3 gets you a lot of security benefits compared to 1.1 and 2. Um, there's already an ITF draft of a modified TLS that is supporting post-quantum. So I think it will more likely be an extension, an extension of 1.3 than a TLS 1.4. But I'm not highly familiar with the IETF processes, so. So upgrade to 1.3 and then up, upgrade your cipher suite when, uh, when you can. There's another question there in the back of the room. Uh, when I go to keylength.com, it seems that uh, I can use RSA uh, 4000 uh, or ECC 500, uh, and nobody forced me to use public, uh, I mean, post-quantum cryptography. When will you, I mean, when do you foresee governments and regulations force the usage of post-quantum crypto cryptography? Yeah, that's a, a good question, uh, but that's more the kind of question that doesn't really have a, a simple answer. Um, if you look at the U.S. government, so they have this project, and they made it very clear from 2015 that they intend to transition to post-quantum cryptography in all the U.S. federal uh, systems. And they did this probably not because like they have a quantum computer in the basement or because they know things that we don't know, but just because I don't know, if you if you worked in the public sector, you know how long it takes to make things change. It might make 20 years, it might take 20 years to, to transition. So from a risk management perspective, that makes sense. So I, I would expect all the critical systems from governments to upgrade at some point, because um, it doesn't cost much. But in terms of actual risk, um, nobody has any idea when or if these quantum, quantum computers will, will appear. From My own personal guess is that I may not see one in my lifetime, um, but some other people are more optimistic. Anybody else? Don't seem so. Thanks a lot again. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone.